laggy or something. We want an experience that is uh, for the end user to be uh, seamless. Also, uh, we want a platform that doesn't tie us to a specific stack. So it doesn't force me to use a specific software or it doesn't force me to uh, stick with a specific uh, tool chain. I want to be free with whatever software stack I'm already developing with. And of course, reliability. So uh, when we're talking again about Java, it's most probably if you're developing with Java, then you are dealing with enterprise and high sensitive data. You're, it's not Node.js, right? So, uh, uh, well, with all due respect to Node.js, I know that it's doing a lot of good business recently, but again, let's stick to the basics. Java is also a very critical application, and then we want a reliable solution. And then one also most important thing is an exit strategy. So let's assume that you picked one platform and you are happy with it, but then later on you discover that this is the correct uh, solution for you, it, you have problem with it or something like that, then you want to make sure that you have a good exit strategy and seamless migration from one platform to the second one. For today, I picked only two topics. And why I picked only those two? Because uh, the cost, if we're talking about cost, that's a very, like, you know, depending topic. It, it really depends on your business application and it really depends on your stack and how, what it consists, what it contains and so on. So it is really, really hard for me to tell you what's going to be the cost for your application. Also for reliability, uh, I mean, I can tell you Amazon is the biggest cloud host in the world and everyone is using it or, or it has like the biggest stack, but then Amazon goes down suddenly and all the, all the internet is down, right? So again, the reliability based on probably your luck, if your most critical user is using your platform at this certain point of view, a point of time, then uh, it, it depends on the platform. So this, those are matrices that are uh, really not uh, measurable. I cannot measure them uh, in a concrete way. I'll leave this homework for you. And I will only focus on the software stack and the ability to exit the platform. But before we uh, deep into this topic a little bit, let's go into the develop, uh, deployment lifecycle in my point of view. How to take your application from ground to the cloud. Well, you bring your application, you bring a server, and deploy, isn't it? Well, not really. I wish, I wish it was that easy. But um, based on how software lifecycle works nowadays, and based on uh, the recommended way on how to deal with your software stack, basically, you must need first to have a version control system. So you deploy your application, uh, and then add features, fix bugs, make code review, do all your homework in maybe your sprint cycle or something like that. And then, when you are ready, you push it to your version control. So this is a step that you are doing probably on daily basis, or maybe you can do it uh, multiple times a day. But then when you push a code, and even if it's merged into the main branch, it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to deploy it to the cloud yet. That's why we need the release cycle. You most probably have at least two branches, one test test branch, for example, and one main branch or release branch. So you might have two different branches in your version control, uh, one branch for testing, deployment, and so on, and one branch when everything is perfect there, then you move to the release branch. So every time you commit your code to the release cycle and give it a version, for example, or a snapshot, that I call it a release cycle. Now, after the release cycle, uh, so you pushed your code to, for example, a development branch or test branch. You want to make sure that the code compiles and the code actually work. Now, when we're talking here about build, we're not talking about the final phase. We are still talking about making sure that your code builds. Now, someone will tell me, okay, but it does compile on my machine, right? Uh, Best practices is that 
you do not rely on your machine. It, we, we all know that it works on our machine, right? We need to also have some kind of build script on your repository or on your backend or on your cloud, as we're going to see, that is automatically try to compile the code as well and try to see if all dependencies are correct and the caching is uh, not like there is no caching libraries that are conflicting with your code and so on, and make sure that the code actually works. And then you can t run your test cases. Again, you should not run or rely only on test units or test cases that are on your, on your local machine, but you need also to apply those tests on some, somewhere else, maybe your cloud provider. Now, after the test cycle, I go back to the packaging cycle. So as I told you, packaging is not building. Building, we want to make sure that the code works and we want to have the binaries that are going to be tested. But after they are tested, maybe your packaging strategy is different. For example, you're adding um, SQL dependencies or connection or network configuration or load balancing and so on. So the packaging phase is not necessarily the same as your build cycle. Now, when everything is ready, you most probably want to go forward for deployment. So why I divided them into those steps? The main reason is because, well, it says deploy here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, you cannot, right? I don't know what to do. But yeah, it says deploy here. So we take all of that and then we finally deploy. Remember that simple take from your machine to the server? You should go over those first. Why I'm saying that? Because then you can really automate your build system and test system and deployment system so that you as a developer, again, do not have to worry about all those configurations again and again. Back in time, we used to like have, for example, a source code or a binary, and then we open a server, Tomcat, for example, put into the deployment folder, and then it deploys. We do not want to do that, right? Especially when we are talking about enterprise. We want to make sure that this cycle goes without any human interaction so that we are reliably make sure that we do not miss anything or anything don't go wrong. Now, if I want to summarize the de deployment lifecycle, I will put it into three main points. The developer, all he has to do on a daily basis is just to push new code versions. What the server does is perform the integration, automatic integration, or what we call continuous integration, and then the server deploys. Ideally, if I manage to get my developer to only commit to the repository, and that's it, and then once the commit goes to, let's say, the test branch or deployment branch, branch, then it automatically goes to the server and gets deployed and available, then I have done the ultimate solution. So those, what I'm gonna take into consideration as well when I am evaluating our cloud providers. Is it gonna allow me to go over those where me as a developer can just push a modification into my repository and then open the link and see modifications? Can I do that? If yes, then they will get more points. If not, if there are manual steps in between, then it will get less points. Now, remember those steps. And back to the evaluation criteria, we decided that we're going to evaluate only software stack and exit strategy. What I'm going to put as uh, differences here is that for the software stack, I want to check if my cloud platform has maybe a cloud repository. It doesn't have to be hosting my code, but at least able to deal with repository. So I personally, I use GitHub because we are open source company, but maybe you are using something else. Maybe you are using Jira, Jira, or not Jira, how is it called? Um, uh, Git, Bitbucket, yeah, Bitbucket. If you are using Bitbucket or GitLabs, for example, or anything else, you might be using anything else. What we want here to make sure that the software stack can deal with your own Git repository. It also can run scripts on the cloud for building, testing, packaging, and so on. And also, it can provide you with whatever web server solution for your application. 
if you are using, for example, Spring or Java EE and so on, then you might need different solutions. Or if you are using Oracle, for example, then you might need web logic and so on. Now, when I talk about exit strategy, I map those into non proprietary tools. I want to make sure that the tools are not only bound to this cloud platform. It's not a new Git platform or it's not a repository that I have to learn and I have to use it. It, it has to be, it, it has to give me the ability to use my own tools like GitHub, GitLabs and so on. It has to give me the ability, if I want to, to use my external build system. So if I'm using Jenkins, for example, they should be able to integrate with Jenkins. They should not tell me you have to follow this specific script for building and so on. And also it has to give me the ability to choose whatever software stack I want. So when I go to the comparing popular providers, I will make sure that I will go over minimal steps for deployment. We agreed that we are all developers. We do not want to learn DevOps and how server works and how all those kind of things and scripts and so on. We just want to know what are the minimal steps to explore that platform, right? And having that, I don't want any of them to ask me to install any plugins. If the cloud tell me you have to install this plugin for CF or whatever, then no, I, I want to avoid that. And I also want to make sure that there is no external command line tools installed or any software. Many cloud providers will start and tell you, if you are using Eclipse, then download this IDE integration and uh, you can like deploy your project and so on. No, I don't want any IDE integration yet because I'm not locked into your platform yet. I want to make sure that I can evaluate on the browser, command line on the browser and do everything on the browser. Let's agree that I'm here all the time talking about evaluation and it's not production. So I welcome all your feedback if you tell me that this is not secure way to do it or this is not the best optimal way to do it. I know we are just evaluating, right? So we want to make sure that my software, my Java application works. It can be actually a JVM application. It doesn't have to be Java. So any Kotlin fans here? No, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, if you have any GVM application and you want to deploy it, we want to just make sure that it actually works. This cloud platform actually can run my application. And then the next step is to know what are the best practices, which is unfortunately I'm not going to cover today. So Amazon, uh, I'm, I'm putting them in an alphabetic order. So don't be surprised if Oracle is the last one or an Oracle event, but it doesn't have to talk about Oracle, right? So uh, Amazon. Um, so I, I have summarized the, the criteria in this link. If you cannot see the link, that's not a problem. I'm going to give you a final link with everything at the end. But let's, let's go to the tutorial page. So here is my experience with Amazon. Uh, I hope at least those tutorials gonna tell you a glimpse about avoiding all those welcome screen and read this tutorial screen and deploy or add your Eclipse plugins and so on. I'm skipping all of that and hitting directly to the business, how to actually get things to work. So if you are in, in hurry, because it's Amazon and you want to just make sure that Amazon can host your application. I have first showed you that uh, this link, in this link you create a free account. Oh, one more criteria that I'm trying to push here is to make sure that it is free. You do not pay anything to evaluate the platform, which is, we, we're gonna see that it's thankfully the case for all my platforms today. This is very good to be able to just get started. So you create a, an AWS account and then there is the build a web application link here. You click on it, you give it application name and here for the platform I use Tomcat, even though there are other servers available. And then I uploaded my WAR file. You can see here that it's built already on my machine and then upload 
and create application. A few seconds later, you get a link with the application working. So this is the manual way. Drag and drop, deploy, you can test and make sure that AWS works. But we agreed, this is not what we want, right? What we want is a full cycle of deployment. So this is a second section about continuous integration where I'm telling you that instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to AWS Management Console and search for something called Code Pipeline. In Code Pipeline, we create a new pipeline. So the pipeline here is similar to my so-called deployment lifecycle, just, just giving it a name. And in this Code Pipeline, we are gonna put all those steps one at a time. So uh, here, we start by creating the pipeline and then, um, as you can see, it gives me several options about what is the location of my source code, but unfortunately, it doesn't have all the available third-party options, probably only GitHub. And then here, you can see that it also provides me, for example, with code commit by AWS. I didn't choose AWS because I want to avoid any vendor lock-in. If I start with this one, then I have to stick with Amazon, which is define my exit strategy. So I picked GitHub for now. Actually, moving forward, I'm gonna try to pick GitHub all the time. Um, so yeah, you, get, you create a GitHub webhooks to be able to listen to the commits when something commits happen to a specific branch. So here you specify the branch. And then um, the second step in my pipeline is to apply a code build. Of course, you, you have the choice to make these, those builds outside the cloud if you want. And in many cases, I would recommend you to do that. Do not be locked into the cloud, unless if you are completely sold to those clouds. Okay, there is no way I'm gonna leave this cloud solution anymore, so I want all my life cycle to be here. But otherwise, it's, it might be a good idea to have your build cycle hosted somewhere else to make sure that you have no lock-ins and no dependencies in your uh, development stage. But here in my case, I used uh, AW, AWS code, uh, code build, and then AWS provides me with a managed server to perform my build application. So I used Linux for sure. Um, if you want to use Windows, that's an option as well, but for, for me here, I had to use uh, uh, Linux. It was easier for me. And then uh, here is the interesting part, which is the build commands. If those build commands were AWS specific or their own scripting tool, I would give them a thumb down. But luckily, this is the Jenkins commands. So something that can be exported and used anywhere else. And what I'm trying to do here is just run Maven package. In my case, my application is packaged using Maven. And then I'm moving the target into war, into root. And then I'm, I'm telling them that my artifact is called root.war. If you're asking why I used root.war, because it's Tomcat, it might be different if your web server application is different. <laughs> and then finally, um, I'm adding the build stage, uh, the, the deployment stage. So where do you want to deploy your application? Uh, I used Elastic Beanstalk, and you can see that here is a code pipeline um, when it's performing the full cycle. So what I do now is I push a new commit to a specific branch. It goes over the code pipeline, build, deploy, and then I can see on my final deployment uh, the final build. So this can be your development or, or test stage where you can test if your application works and so on. And then if everything goes perfectly, then you can mirror this to the release cycle or your release stage. Now, based on this little tutorial, if we want to give a small, t uh, a small score to AWS, what would, would it be in your point of view? <laughs> At least for me, I gave the software stack nine because there is no 10, right? No one will get 10. Just to, just to be sure, there is no one who is gonna get 10. So I give them nine because uh, AWS luckily provides me with a huge variety of software and standard software that I can use. And even in the 
uh, build system, they provide me with uh, two platforms from which I can choose how the build is performed. But for the exit strategy, I give them nine because uh, they are, there are still AWS specific, specific bumps that I still have to use. It's not fully deployed as uh, an independent standard way. And when I say independent standard way, we're going to see it in a little bit, I'm talking about something like container. Now, you can tell me that, OK, AWS can have a container, right? That's a different thing. So if we're using a container, then we are not really uh, evaluating a Java application. We are evaluating if a container can be deployed on this platform or not. Also, just to give you a glimpse about this moving forward, all what I have picked today for you have very good score. So don't be like, don't wait for a very low score, or anything like that. All of them have very good score. I'm just giving you why I'm giving like the final score or not the final score. Now, the next one is Google Cloud Platform or GCP. So the tutorial for GCP. is over here. So as we agreed, we start with a free account. Actually, Google does not provide any free account, but once you sign up for the first time, they give you some kind of credit, like $300 or $200, so you can use them. And then when you use them, what I do is basically create a new project, and then uh, they have the so lovely command line tool or shell tool in the browser. So instead of downloading plugins or downloading any external dependencies, you can just run your command in the browser. So I launched the command line tool and here is the hack. I call it a hack. Here is what I did. I just cloned my GitHub repository into a local folder and then run Maven package. Why this is a hack? Because this is not a continuous integration. This is just a manual integration. And this is a second hack, which basically I'm running Jetty on a server and relying on a server. Again, this is just to make sure that the application works. So the application run, compiles, build, test succeeded, and then it works. And then there is this little icon that tells me preview on port 8080. OK? So based on this little evaluation, I at least managed to know that Google Cloud Platform can host my Java application and it can work. But I was not satisfied because at this point, I didn't manage to reach my deployment lifecycle that I wish for. I don't have like automatic integration. I don't have like a stable software stack where to push my server and so on. Well, about, about continuous integration, Google has something called object change notifier. You can check it out. It's a little bit lengthy process, but it's a process, a little bit different process, how to uh, build a webhooks to monitor your GitHub or your Git repository, for example, to any new version and then take a copy and push it into your uh, local application. But again, at this point, I still don't have the full life cycle. And at this point, I had to give Google those score. So for the software stack, I didn't really get what I want. But for the exit strategy, since I didn't even lock in with Google, I can really leave because I didn't really install anything Google related, right? It was all my own dependencies as in plugins. But why that? Why the software stack didn't satisfy me? Because apparently how Google works right now is basically you have to use a container. If, if you have to, uh, to have your software stack and whatever you want to build on top of it. You cannot just ask Google, please install a Tomcat for me and please install, a, a, I don't know, this application for me and Jenkins for me and so on. Google doesn't allow that. You have to use a container. I found it an um, interesting approach. So you build your own container. Everyone knows a container, right? Obviously. So a container, basically you build your container, you put whatever software stack in it, and then it helps you to deploy this container. And then at this point, we give it a thump up. So maybe you have noticed that the continuation of this article is basically deploy your Java application on a Kubernetes container, which is linked here.
Um, to use a container on Google, you have to get a storage for it. Uh, then you build a container registry. You have to enable it first, and then you build a container registry, and then you move your application to the container. You can also build it on a cluster, so that if you want to mirror this container or make load balancing and so on, and you deploy the container. Now, when I say container, it might be a different opinion at this point, because the cloud didn't really help me much at this point. It's not a managed cloud, but also, some enterprises will see it as a perfect solution because it's me who shows the whole software stack and I'm not locked into any platform. Now, if I want to leave Google and go to Oracle, for example, what I'm going to do is basically just take this container out and push it inside Oracle and that's it. Um, so after the deployment, I also uh, had to, uh, to give it some uh, public exposure so that I can read it and the network can read it internally. So the container for security reason is only available internally. So I have to expose it and give it an IP from where I can uh, preview it online on public. And then this is the final IP that's going to be available for you from which you can see the test application. So based on this, I gave Google Cloud Platform plus containers and nine and nine. Again, I know that some of you will not be very happy with non-managed solution, but also if you are looking for a managed solution and if you are looking at a container, then this is one of the best for you because you just take a container as it is, push it and so on. The next on the list is Heroku. Uh, anyone he heard about Heroku before? Awesome. Okay, so the back side of the of the room heard about it. The front didn't. That's good. So Heroku, I picked Heroku because of my personal opinion. I blogged about it, where I wanted a very, very, very fast solution to just deploy and demonstrate my demo application to the customer, and I didn't want to like sign up for a Google account or AWS account and validate and uh, do all those kind of things. I didn't, I didn't want to like go over a lot of hassles, and fortunately Heroku did that for me. They provided me out of the box solution to just run and deploy and do everything in literally two minutes. Uh, this is a kind of user experience that I really love. We agreed that we, we cannot evaluate the reliability and the performance at this point, but what we are gonna just um, evaluate is again the deployment lifecycle. So you create a Heroku account, and then create a Heroku app, and then link the GitHub. So it can be a Heroku Git if you want to use their own Git repository. Interestingly, it can be a Dropbox. <laughs> so you can just use your WAR file, put it in Dropbox. So yeah, it's funny, right? But this is what they did. They just want to make it as fast as possible to get into business and get to try their platform and see if you're happy with it or not. So I give them my, local, my, my private GitHub, and then uh, there is something called automatic deploy and selected the branch master in this demo, and deploy branch for the first time, you just click the button, but then after that, whenever any commits goes to that branch, it will automatically goes to the deployment. So fast. Very nice, satisfies me, does all the things that I need. But after playing with Heroku a little bit, I figured out that again, maybe Heroku provides me with a lot of useful uh, software stack that I can use, but it is probably best to use Heroku with a container again. So at this point, if we're talking about a uh, container, then uh, GCP or Heroku could be a seamless experience. You just have an a container, you deploy it to Google or Heroku. At this point, maybe other factors are going to be uh, the deciding factor for you, like price, performance, and reliability. So based on that, I gave Heroku 9 and 9 as well. Uh, as you can see, I didn't really rely on any external uh, software stack or anything like that. 
Next on the list, Microsoft Azure. Yes, Azure didn't come up in the list because I put Microsoft. So, Microsoft Azure. Anyone used Microsoft Azure before? Okay, how is your experience? Good, bad? <laughs> what are you using now? Are you using? Okay, cool. Yeah, so Microsoft Azure. I use Microsoft Azure in two phases in my life. Once when Microsoft Azure just appeared and I felt that this is not a good playground for Microsoft, please quit this business. But then uh, I played with them again uh, recently and there is a huge difference. I think they have rewritten the user experience and they have rewritten everything and it's really, yeah, uploads very good, <laughs> very good work Microsoft. Um, So, you sign up for a Microsoft account and don't do like me after you sign up and evaluate, please exit, because they charged me a lot. <laughs> uh, they charged me a lot for some reason, I don't know why. But anyway, they give you one month free. At oh, when I say Microsoft charged me, they cut my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here in Microsoft or Oracle even? <laughs> So um, you create an account and then, um, since we're talking about web application, I went to web application and I choose Linux, not Windows. So again, one very interesting thing that they give you also the platform to choose, which is excellent. So I used Linux and I used Tomcat for my evaluation and then uh, I went to deployment center. And here in deployment center, you can see also that they are giving you options on what is your source control or what is your version control. And they are using Bitbucket, so that's also excellent. Uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, or local Git. Uh, and Azure repo, so uh, they also have their own private uh, repository if you want. They have also FTP, so if this is your thing. Um, but yeah, so at the beginning I decided to use local Git and by local git is mainly copying my own repository into a local git instead of using their own repository. So that's also one approach if you do not want to exit your own repository and you want to just uh, allow Azure to make a copy in their cloud, that's one option for you. And I find it very interesting if you, don't want, uh, if you do not want Azure to access your own GitHub account or your own Bitbucket account and so on. Um, and then the next step is to go to the Kudu build server and decide how the deployment happens. So it, it picks, for example, my master branch or my deployment branch, and whenever there is a new commit happening there, then it takes it and push it inside my uh, server. Um, how, how, to push, how to push your application to the local Git? So you want to mirror your application from locally to the local Git on the Azure server, then it gives you, a, it generates a credential for you. You can show the password and copy it or you can just uh, take uh, an authentication key and copy it locally to use. Just to not leave everything open, I also decided to try GitHub. So when you go to GitHub, it gives you even more uh, interesting options because it lists all your repositories and then you can select which, which branch to uh, listen to, to, listen, to, to have hooks on it. And then when you click finish, uh, you can start synchronization. Synchronization is going to start automatically, but you can forcefully start synchronization to see uh, the deployment cycle happening. Also, you can restart the server if you want to. Um, I restarted the server to forcefully be able to see the deployment and comments happening right away. And here is the final. So this is probably the first time to see the final application that I've been deploying all the time. So this is a final application and I was trying to highlight that the URL will be different because I used Tomcat. But of course, you can change it. If you dot war, then it's gonna work. So Microsoft Azure, the experience, I think it went also great. And I was uh, pretty happy with what happened. Uh, if you have noticed, they also can support containers, of course, but uh, we're, we're trying to check managed solutions. 
So, um, so the software stack, uh, I give it eight because not all the servers that I wished for were available on Azure. Uh, I believe they are adding more stack onto their platform. That's why probably this is going to be better in the future. And then uh, the exit strategy was eight again because of the deployment. So the deployment, unfortunately, was not visible to me how the deployment happened. I cannot modify it myself. And I have to use Azure specific tools to be able to modify how the deployment cycle works. Uh, but if you move to, for example, external deployment, and you decide on your own how the deployment happens, for example, on a Jenkins server or something like that, then you should be OK with Microsoft. Last but not least, Oracle. Anyone is using Oracle Cloud here? No one. <laughs> OK, Sh should we just raise our hands in <laughs> Because Oracle event, Oracle Cloud. <laughs> so, deploying to Oracle. Uh, to be able to deploy to Oracle freely, you need to request a free account at the beginning. I think you have to make a request and then they will respond to you after a while. Uh, but then, that's if you just want to start a free deployment. But then um, once you sign up, you can go to customize dashboard. And I choose here a Java deployment. You can use container as well, as you can see. And this is a very important screen because this is going to decide later on on my choices. Uh, so I use a Java application. And then again, Oracle provides a very lovely uh, server console where you can uh, have a command line tool on the browser. Now, when I created a new instance, um, I selected Java as my new instance, and then I give it my details, what, what is the instance, and so on. But then here is, here is my, like, can I zoom in here? Here is my concern. It has to be Oracle WebLogic. I'm not talking about a container. I'm talking about the default deployment cycle. It has to be Oracle WebLogic. If you're a, an Oracle customer, or if your software stack relies on Oracle, I think this is going to go excellent for you. If you are using Java EE also, and you don't mind having Oracle WebLogic and so on, this is going to be excellent for you. But if for some reason you want something different, then you will be forced to use a container. Now, also, the software edition and all these kind of things, you had to sign up for all Oracle kind of uh, tools and Oracle software and edition and so on. And this is my feedback for Oracle Cloud. This is a huge login. So if you go to Oracle Cloud, they provide you with a huge, nice platform, but they lock you into the platform. Uh, this is basically one of the biggest uh, decisions that you might want to take when you are deciding on your software stack. Do you want to be locked into Oracle or not? In some situations, you will be happy with that if you are an Oracle developer or your applications are basically Oracle. If you play a little bit with Oracle uh, platform, you will find also that it's uh, hugely integrated with all Oracle tools and um, and all these kind of things. So uh, you'll find yourself happy using Oracle Cloud. But if you are just evaluating it for something completely different, like, I don't know, your PHP application or something, then you might need to reconsider. Now, as you can see, the deployment also went quite straightforward. Um, and here is my WebLogic uh, console where I can perform all my uh, deployment application online. Uh, I can manage the console. I can do everything. And as we agreed, I didn't want to download any local plugins or anything like that. There was all the way Oracle recommending me to use Eclipse tools uh, to make things faster or make uh, have a local version of Oracle WebLogic to be able to synchronize with the server version of WebLogic and so on. I didn't want to show that in my tutorial. I wanted to make sure that I go all the way online to be able to free and minimal steps to be able to check if this uh, platform for me or not, and then move on to the next platform. So uh, based, based on this, 
And my score for Oracle is, everyone is looking, <laughs> 7 and 7. So I explained software stack. In my own case, the software stack was a huge Oracle lock-in, and I didn't like that. Uh, I wanted to be free to use any software stack that I want. I didn't want to be locked into Oracle. But if you are, I think, I think this is mainly how Oracle Cloud is managed right now. It's mainly targeting people who are using already Oracle applications. You are using Oracle database, you are using Oracle developer application, you are using uh, maybe some other Oracle tools, EBS, I don't know what, then you will find very good integration with Oracle services and everything works seamlessly together. But if you are not, then maybe you will have to use it to a uh, container. And eventually, because the lack of availability of software stack and forcing me to use Oracle-specific software, then the exit strategy will not be as good because if I want to exit, I need to migrate every single piece of thing to non-Oracle thing. So that's a little bit of an offer. Nevertheless, this score doesn't mean anything because, uh, like it's not final because uh, I didn't put the score for, for example, reliability and performance. So. Oracle really did a good job for the performance, at least. I've seen that myself. And as of right now, since it's a huge Oracle managed software stack, then we can at least rely on it. As of right now, we don't have any major problem with the reliability of Oracle Cloud. I cannot talk about the cost, though, mainly because I'm not a sales guy, but also because uh, it depends on your software stack. So having said that, I hope uh, this summary give you an overview about uh, what to do, what, how to start. This is a link where I summarized all of those uh, kind of tutorials. Uh, feel free to go and ping me if I'm mistaken in any uh, step of those. But basically, you can see how you can go yourself, take your WAR file and evaluate it on huge cloud platform, make sure that the development cycle is applied, make sure that there is a good test deploy package build plan for your, for your application and then uh, make sure also to be able to evaluate without, the, uh, without downloading any external plugins or anything like that. I don't know how much time I'm left for me, but can I take questions if there is any? <laughs> any questions, by the way? No questions? Everything is clear? Awesome. So then at this point, I would say thank you so much for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.